Uh, hi, um, uh, mate. Um, I look down on him because he is middle class. I am upper class. Of course, if you were to meet me, I would insist that I am middle class. And I would insist that I am middle class in spite of the fact that I was brought up in a castle in Shropshire that used to be a monastery before the Reformation. I went to Eton, and when I left university, Daddy got me a job at a bank in the city of London where he happens to be on the board of directors. But even so, I, I, I would insist to you that I am middle class. Uh, but actually, I am upper class, and that is why I look down on him. I look up to him because he is upper class. I, and I look down on him because he is working class. I am middle class. Of course, if you were to meet me, I wouldn't actually admit to being middle class. I would say that I was comfortable or privileged. But um, in, in reality, I am probably what you might want to call upper middle class. And there is, I, I, I wouldn't want to admit it, I would never admit it to you, but there is also, if being an animal, I look up to social status and I look up to uh, hereditary genetic breeding. And that is one of the reasons why I look up to him, but I would never, ever admit this to you. And I look down to him, and again, I would never, ever admit this to you, because he is vulgar and disgusting and makes me want to be sick and voted for Brexit. He really is vermin. What did you call me? What did you say? What did you say I am? I, I, I said you were vermin. Well, yeah, well, come on then. Come on, do you want to start? you want to start? Come on then. Yeah. I look up to him and him because he is, well, upper middle class and he's upper class. But I look a lot more up to him because he has a lot in common with me. We want the same kind of things. Whereas that guy in the middle, he wants to destroy England and turn it into just a foreign country where everyone's foreign and where, you know, you, you, got, you, you can't do anything and you can't say anything. And so I eat him. I eat his guts. I'll, I'll, I'll take him on. I would take him on. Hello, hello, hello. Now, uh, today I'd like to talk about social class. And specifically, I'd like to talk about social class in England. Uh, this is something that a few of you, quite a few of you are from America, and uh, you, you, you're quite interested in this subject. And also, if you're English, people seem to be quite interested in it as well. So let's look at the issue of the English social class system. Now, what is social class? Social class is a means by which we divide society up along socio-economic lines, along the lines of things like education, along the lines of your background, along the lines of what kind of job you do and your income. And this seems to work as a, a means, as a system of categories, as a means of understanding the world, because there is a strong degree to which people socialise with and have children with and, and, and generally interact with people who are like them. There is a degree to which, a strong degree to which society is stratified. People interact with people who are the same as them. And therefore, social class becomes a series of intercorrelated characteristics and it, it permits successful predictions to be made about people. Successful predictions about what, kind of, what they're going to be like, what, they're, what, they're, what, the, what kind of things they're going to like, what kind of things they're going to not like, what their behaviour patterns are going to be like, that kind of thing. So that is social class and it is as useful and as uncontroversial, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, um, as any other category that there might be in social science, or at least um, it should be. Except, of course, people in the middle class are likely to insist that there's no such thing as social class in order to, uh, in order to play for intellectual status and seem intelligent, and we'll look at that possibility uh, later. Now, the, the main model of social class in England has been proposed by Michael Argyle, um, who is, was a, a sort of a social psychologist of, of class, really. And he divided this England up as follows. He said at the top there is the upper class. The upper class, although few of them would say they are upper class, is composed of the old aristocracy, these kinds of people, and simply very, very wealthy, successful people in business and... Um, law and whatever, who have, uh, who have joined the ranks of that class, and, it's, and, and to a certain degree, the ruling class, the people who are running the country in terms of politics, law, uh, that sort of thing. That should be understood as the upper class. Then there is the upper middle class. The upper middle, uh, the upper middle class, or what he calls um, uh, high, uh, what we, higher professionals, I suppose you'd say. Um, the upper, upper middle class, you have people like lawyers and doctors and architects, 
these are the higher professionals. These are the, the, and they are higher in terms often of how much they're paid, and also in terms of how educated they are and the respect that their job uh, accords them. Then below them you have what, what he would call the middle middle class. Uh, these are the lower professionals, people who are uh, people such as school teachers and nurses and um, sort of certain kinds of accountant and whatever. These are the lower professionals. They have professional qualifications, but they are not as they are clearly distinct in terms of who they socialise with and in terms of all kinds of other factors as well from the higher professionals. Then you have the lower middle class. The lower middle class are, are people who have a certain who are the, 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 the majority, the vast majority of English society at the moment, uh, which is the, the, the typical person that does an office job, uh, nine to five, which he doesn't really understand, doing some dull thing, data inputting or whatever, working for some company, um, office managers, uh, people that keep accounts in firms, that sort of thing. Uh, that that is that is that is the essence, and also policemen and firemen and people that have some degree of training. Perhaps you could put into that uh, certain sort of specialised butchers even and plumbers and maybe they would all count because they have some training as being lower middle class these days but but it's it's the things with these categories they're never exactly clear at the borders then beneath them you have the working class that is those that engage in manual labor with various degrees of training this would be people like car mechanics builders uh, people that work in shops, most of them, uh, that sort of thing, and, and have not, not much in the way of professional or formal qualifications. And then beneath them you have what he calls the underclass, and the underclass is basically the long-term unemployed, uh, marginalised immigrants, semi-criminal types, whatever. And that is, that is the essence, he argues, of the English class system. So he essentially reduces it down to the kind of job you do. Now, there is a degree to which that works, if one simplifies it, yes, you know, the kind of job one does and the status accorded to one's job is significant. But um, in terms of, of saying social class, but it's not quite so in England. Because, for example, if you were to have somebody who was, let's say, a doctor, and they sp and they ha but they were brought up working class and they had all of the sort of cultural associations of being working class and the interests of being working class and whatever, then quite a few people in England would refer to that person as a working class doctor. And similarly, if you had somebody that had been to public school and whatever, and, and, and uh, Eton and, and, and uh, uh, post university and all this kind of thing, uh, and yet they had uh, got, got a job as a school teacher, a lot of people might see that person as a kind of eccentric, upper class school teacher. Um, I, my mother was at university with Harold Wilson's Harold Wilson, the, the Prime Minister Harold Wilson's son, and he was a maths teacher. I don't think many people regarded him as. The, the typical kind of middle middle class school teacher. I mean, his father was a university lecturer turned prime minister. So you get these people that are on the borders, you see, and that's the case with any um, any such system. And so an alternative system has been presented by Kate Fox in her book Watching the English, and she argues that social class is a series of different facets. It's, 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 it, there's a subjective dimension to it, and it's a series of different um, sort of elements that come together. Obviously, one of them is the kind of job you do, another is how much money you earn, another is how educated you are, and also things that, like where you're educated, because certain um, educational institutions, such as the public schools or private schools or certain universities, are associated with the upper class. And another is simply an issue of culture, of your kind of class culture. And this is quite important uh, in England. It can be seen in many, many ways. One of them is the kind of words you use. So, for example, it is said that one way you could understand an English person's social class is by saying something a bit quietly like this and seeing how they respond. And if they were to say, what? Then it would be upper class. If they were to say, sorry? Upper middle class. Pardon? Lower middle class. What? working class. And there are many other examples of this sort of thing. Um, another would be what you, where you go to the loo. Uh, upper class people would perhaps say something like lavatory, upper middle class people, loo, lower middle class people, toilet, and working class people, something like, I don't know, bong or something like that. Crapper, shitter. Uh, and, uh, and, and there are many other examples of words you use. Do you call it a serviette or do you call it a napkin? 
Um, and there was a book by this called Na on this uh, by Nancy Mitford called You and Non You. It's a bit out of date now, of course, because it was written uh, quite a while ago in the fifties, I think it was, but or even, uh, even earlier. But but it, it looks at this social class culture, these kinds of things. Do you have a satellite dish on your house? Um, Kate Fox argues that having a satellite dish is a surefire sign of being working class, and you can assess the working classness or otherwise of a neighbourhood by counting the percentage of houses that have satellite dishes on them. Do you have a garden gnome in your garden? Likewise, working class. But then you get, um, and, but then you get issues of class insecurity. She notes. So one of the things that people don't want to do is be perceived as a member of the class that is below them. If they are on the borders of the class, then then they, they they're insecure about it. So for example, a lot of people who are lower middle class or middle class would not want to have a garden gnome in their garden, even if they like garden gnomes, because they'd be insecure and they think that somebody might think they were working class. Whereas you'll find that somebody who is upper class won't care about things like this. And this is something that Kate Box calls the garden gnome rule. Someone who's upper class will just like garden gnomes and have a garden gnome. And say, oh yes, garden gnome, yes, that's my gnome. I'm very proud of my gnome. Because, because he's no way is anyone going to think that he could possibly be working class. So who cares? Um, he, he's too secure in his status to bother. Whereas this would not perhaps be the case with a struggling member of the middle class. So uh, the, the culture, the, even things like what time you have dinner, what you call dinner, um, is another issue of social class. Now, the history of social class in England is consistent with this, uh, with this model of, of it being a series of factors that come together. So um, until really the 18th century, England was a rank society. People didn't talk about social class. They talked about ranks. Uh, the rank at the top was the so-called upper sort was composed of the, at the top of it was, of course, the king. And then you had the nobility. And then that was the, the upper nobility, the people that sat in the House of Lords and whatever. And then you had the lower nobility, which was the gentry. The gentry was composed of knights, of esquires, which were the uh, the descendants in the male line of nobles, um, and also simply uh, our midgerous, they had a coat of arms, and the, uh, uh, wealthy uh, landowners. Um, and then there was the gentlemen, these would be our midgerous but, uh, landowners, but less wealthy uh, than the esquires. And then you had the plain gentlemen who wouldn't be armidurous, but they would perhaps want to be armidurous. They'd want to have a coat of arms because that was the, the marker of being upper class um, and or, 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 or being a part of the upper sort. And, and they had, but they were kind of gentlemen. They were they were gentry by common acclamation. They had the lifestyle of the upper sort of the, of the gentry and consequently they were accepted as being gentry and they would play for status by adopting a coat of arms they weren't entitled to. And every so often the College of Arms would tour around the counties and demand that people present their pedigrees, their family trees, to prove they had the right to bear coat armour. And they would disgrace people who they felt weren't gentlemen, who were playing for status. And they would elevate to arbitrariness uh, gentlemen uh, who, who, did, who were accepted as having the, um, the, the requisite attributes of being a gentleman. And there were cases, it wasn't simply about how much money you had, it was all, all your education, it was also about lifestyle. So there was a case in Essex in the early 1600s of somebody called Edmund Blagg, and uh, he wanted, to, he was calling himself gentleman, and he wanted to have a coat of arms, and they wouldn't give him one on the grounds that the gates of his property were not greasy enough. The idea being that part of being a genuinely a gentleman is that you, 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 you hold port, you give lots of charity to the poor or whatever, and so therefore you will put out meat every day for the, for the, for the poor to take away and eat, and there'll be grease on your gates, and he didn't do that, so he was not allowed to have a coat of arms. Now beneath them was what was called the, uh, the middling sort, the top rank of this was what we call the yeoman, uh, the yeoman were gentlemen farmers basically that would do some labour themselves, um, and they would be paralleled by merchants and that sort of thing. Then beneath them was this really, really a bit like the lower middle class, the husbandmen. Um, they were farmers that would take to the plough themselves, um, but they were still quite wealthy. And they were paralleled by what you call the, uh, the, the craftsmen. And then beneath these were the lower sort, that is to say cottagers, that is people with a small holding who would do some labour on other people's farms, uh, and shepherds and labourers. And then beneath them was just paupers that didn't have any money. Now... One of the interesting things about these categories was they they were again they were never clear cut and they were never totally based on money. So you'd have people who you have somebody who was a husbandman who had more money than a gentleman, but because he had the lifestyle of a husbandman because he was frugal and because he did some a lot of physical labour himself, people would say he was a husbandman. Um, and, and similarly, you might have someone who was 
by any normal definition, a, 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 a squire. There was a case actually of this of somebody who was put in debtor's prison who was an esquire, and and he in, insisted on being addressed as such, uh, and and he showed his long pedigree to the jailer uh, to say, look, I'm an esquire. You have to call me esquire. And the guy just the jailer just took his pedigree away and laughed. Because the attitude was, how could you possibly port to be a member of the upper sort if you're here in debtor's prison? Don't be ridiculous. So, so it's, a, it's a combination of these different factors that creates uh, these different ranks. Now, this starts to change, uh, fall apart, the rank society in the 18th century for a number of reasons. First of all, they're always with social ranks. People will play for status and want to be regarded as the rank that's above theirs. There'll always be the expansion of the respectable category. You see this at the moment with the word professor. Professor used to refer in England simply to a person who was the chair, had a chair in a particular subject. Now you see it expanding and people talking about associate professors and, and, and this sort of thing. So you always get this expansion. One of the expansions you got was yeoman. So fewer and fewer people would call themselves husbandmen, and people would people would try to flatter others by calling them yeoman. And consequently, the, the yeoman expands, the husbandman contracts, and then small farms become economically impossible. And so the concept of the husbandman collapses, and eventually, pretty much all farmers that do some labour themselves are yeoman. And the word is simply abandoned in favour of just farmer. Um, similarly, at the other end, you see the, the the use of gentleman expands and expands and expands. Originally, gentleman was restricted to people who had the livestock. Style of a, of a gentleman farmer, I were fantastically rich, um, and also barristers and university graduates, and it expands to take in the, the whole professional middle class, doctors and architects and all this, and they're all calling themselves gentlemen, and then eventually it gets down to sort of shopkeepers and whatever by the late eighteenth century, calling themselves gentlemen, and so the concept again just becomes meaningless and falls away, and you end up with these different social classes and people thinking of themselves and identifying quite strongly, particularly in a society where social movement was not that substantial, people identifying quite strongly by the Victorian era with having a certain social class and it being quite clear that although these weren't fixed categories and there were people that were on the borders as there are with all categories, there were definite social classes with definite distinct interests. Now one of the ways that this became quite prominent was with the so-called moral panics and this again brings you back to the class insecurities of what it is um, that, that defines class, what, what makes you middle class as opposed to working class or upper class. And this was very interesting. And you see it a great deal in the 19th century. Um, and, and this is very much when the middle classness, people start to self-identify as middle class. They realise, I'm not upper class. The upper class don't need to work. The upper class are gentlemen, whatever. I have to work. But, um, in that sense, I'm a worker, but I'm, I'm not working class. I'm different from these working class people. How am I different? Um, and, then they, and how are they different is a number of things that define middle classness. One one of them is education, and there is a tendency for the middle class to stress education, to say they have different values from the working class or the upper class, both of whom value money. Um, the upper class will value money plus ancestry. The working class will value money plus kind of toughness and that sort of thing, sports, whatever. Um, but the middle class, it's a value for education as a good in itself. And this becomes a value of the, of the, Victor of the Victorian middle class. Another is morality. They'll say, oh, well, you know, we're not like either the working class or the upper class because the, they're immoral. They're, they're not religious. They, they, they're ungodly. And, and we're in that sense superior to them. And so how can we stress our middle classes? How can we make it clear to everyone we're middle class? Well, the answer is these moral panics that you get against alcohol uh, in the 19th century, that you get against pornography and sexual issues and whatever. And you could perhaps even trace that back to the 15th, to the 16th or 17th century and look at the Puritans and what a lot of the Puritans were were middle class people they were a lot of them were merchants and craftsmen and people like this who were engaging in, with, with Protestantism really in a kind of moral panic and it, and, uh, it was the upper class that were Catholic it was it, 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 Protestantism came from the middle class. It was pushed by the middle class. And it can be argued as an attempt to gain moral status and say, OK, yeah, we're not upper class. We're not upper class. Fine, but we're, we're not as high as you, but we're more moral than you. 
We're superior to you in that way. We're more moral than you. We're more religious than you. We're more intellectual than you. Um, so this goes back all that as for the working class. Well, you know, again, we're more moral than you. You have illegitimate children and, and fornication and whatever. We're not like that. And if you go into the Victorian era, it's very clear. It was quite acceptable up until that point for upper class people upper, to have illegitimate children by mistresses as long as they could afford to sustain them. And there was a great deal of illegitimacy among the working class as well. Now, as the middle class values take over in Victorian England, illegitimacy becomes increasingly socially unacceptable. Um, and indeed, Queen Victoria banished from court her relatives who had illegitimate children by mistresses. Um, and, and, and it became much more kind of taboo. It still happened, of course, but it to have mistresses. King Edward VII had a mistress, but it became much more taboo and less out in the open. Whereas if you go back to the 16th century, it was openly the case that these people would have mistresses. And people knew who they were. And this is demonstrating the influence of middle class values as as farming, which was associated with the landowners' contracts, and these people from middle-class backgrounds, who are the industrialists and the lawyers and whatever, and the bureaucrats, take over society, and their Puritan values begin to take over society. And so you have these moral panics. And you could argue that the, the moral panics of today uh, against um, you know, climate rebellion uh, and, 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 and against racism and all of this stuff that you would associate in England with the new Labour, particularly, can be regarded as the descendants of these earlier Victorian moral panics, which are in turn the descendants of these Puritan, Protestant moral panics. A lot of people have commented on the Puritanism of the Extinction Rebellion. It's a way of asserting social class status, of saying I am superior to the working class because the working class is Brexit chaff scum um, and i'm superior to the upper class because the upper class although they are upper class they are they are they are ugh, these old etonian yuck you know the, the immoral people they have no social conscience they, they they have no morality and so that that is that is that is the essence of our of the social class system in england um, and there is a degree to which it is uh, a genetic issue as well because then if you look into what it is which um predicts social class in england and other countries as well the key thing is intelligence so intelligence Intelligence predicts socioeconomic status at about 0.5, and intelligence is about 0.8 heritable. It's very highly heritable. Another thing is personality. Socioeconomic status predicts um, so is predicted by conscientiousness at about 0.5 as well, uh, and this is at least 0.5, if not more, heritable. General factor of personality. General factor of personality is a a, a general factor that is beneath the uh, really a kind of pro-social personality. A personality predicts getting on in life. And that is underpinned by aspects of conscientiousness, that is to say rule following, agreeableness, that is to say altruism and empathy, uh, neuroticism, that is to say mental instability, i.e. low neuroticism. Uh, <clears throat> but high aspects of neuroticism, such as within reason worrying about things, because this acts as a motivator, um, extroversion, again aspects of extroversion, and, and openness, that is to say being open to new things and whatever. And, and it is having this high general factor of personality which weakly predicts socioeconomic status. There's all kinds of interesting variations on that, but, but this, is, this, is, uh, this is generally uh, how it works. General factor of personality predicts socioeconomic status, and this is a heritable thing. Um, now, there is an environmental element to all of these. For example, the research by Von Strum found that the IQ difference between five-year-olds who are working class and five-year-olds the middle class is a few points, maybe five points when they're about six years old. And by the time they're 18 years old, it's massively, massively expanded because, of course, the... the uh, the environment of the middle class is being pushed to its phenotypic limit, phenotypic maximum in terms of intelligence all the time. It's highly intellectually stimulating, so it, pushes, it, 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 so it creates a snowball effect. A bit like uh, if you are dyslexic, you may have a slightly lower IQ than someone who's not dyslexic, but it will get lower and lower and lower. as uh, the, bigger, the difference will get bigger and bigger and bigger as the non-dyslexic is reading more and learning new words, and words are thinking tools, and consequently they're thinking in a more uh, in-depph and analytical way and consequently their IQ relative to yours goes up and up and up. Well it's it's a very similar thing with social class. So there are social class differences in IQ uh, with uh, uh, intelligence predicts uh, class but they are made bigger by uh, in, uh, the environment and what this does in pushing the intellectual abilities of the middle class to their phenotypic maximum. Uh, but, but even so there is clearly a genetic element 
to these differences. This has been uh, clearly demonstrated in his book, uh, Greg Clark, The Sun Also Rises. He shows that there's a degree to which English social classes are castes. The heritability of social class, socioeconomic status across generations in England in the medieval period in 1950 was 0.7. So this means although there is, of course, social movement based on random genetics and whatever, uh, it's very, very rare. It's a, not a, it's a rare thing. In general, socioeconomic status is highly heritable across time. And it doesn't matter which country it is, whether it's England or India or Sweden, they found exactly the same thing. Uh, point seven. Uh, secondly, in terms of genetics, it, it has been found that there are certain alleles that are associated with high educational attainment. And there was a study which found that these are highest in the English, uh, and thus in the intelligence, these are highest in the English upper classes, and they get fewer and fewer and fewer as you move down the social scale. So again, there is a clear genetic element to its social class uh, in England. Um, another one was genes associated with life history strategy. That is to say, do you live fast and die young, or do you live slow and invest lots of energy in your offspring and whatever, and, 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 and die old, as it were? Um, basically, this can be reduced down to are you sexually promiscuous or are you not sexually promiscuous? What was found is that genes that predict being sexually promiscuous are higher in the, the lower social classes in England than they are in the higher social classes in England. And that would correlate with um, things like your, it's how you see time. Do you live for the now or do you live for the future? If you live for the future, you are likely to move up to the top of the social hierarchy. And of course, if you're born into it, then you are likely to stay there, to not move down. So there is a clear genetic element to social class in that regard as well. And this is reducible even to blood groups. There was a study that found that if you divide England up into five socioeconomic classes uh, based on income and education, then... Um, Blood group A is found among 57% of socioeconomic status group 1 and 41% of socioeconomic status group 5. So they are genetically distinct even in terms of their blood group. And so the Victorians were on to something when they looked at the working class um, almost as a different race. There's a degree, there is some evidence that that is the case. Now this fits with J. Philippe Rushton's model of, of genetic similarity theory, of course, where he argues that uh, what you want to do as an organism is pass on your genes. You do so directly by having children, but you do so indirectly by investing in your kin and by investing in people who are genetically similar to you. Now, one of the ways you do this, of course, is investing in even friends have been shown to be more genetically similar to each other than two random members of the population. And so you can see why people would be attracted to other people of their socioeconomic class and why this would help to make social class casts with different blood groups over time because of course people are motivated by genetic similarity and a desire to pass on their genes. So social economic class therefore in England can be seen to be a very tangible thing. You'll get people, often people who were middle class and university lecturers and whatever and, and voted for Remain, who will say, oh, well, perhaps class is an outdated concept and, you know, we're not sure. No, evidently not. It can be reduced down to differences in genetics. It has clear uh, consequences and it is something that is tangible and real. What is the future for social class? Well, it's evident that socioeconomic status is negatively associated with fertility. Weekly, negatively associated, but it is. Intelligence is weakly at point one, minus point one, negatively associated with fertility in England, as it is in many other Western countries. And so what this means is that every generation, the people at the top, the most intelligent people are boiling off, um, and they are being replaced by the people at the bottom. And the, the bottom, the, what the, uh, the Victorians would have called the scum, the people that would have been in the workhouse, people right at the bottom of society, what my grandfather's generation called those that were a bit rough. They are expanding and expanding and expanding. And so you can see what consequences this is going to have for the future of society. At the moment in England, if you divide up the society, according to Adam Perkins, into uh, families where both parents are working, uh, i.e. above average intelligence, families where one parent is working, i.e. a bit below average intelligence, and families where no parent is working, where both are on welfare, then only those where both parents are on welfare are breeding at above replacement fertility. So you can see, that, and that's within, among native people, so you can see what this is going to mean in the future. It's going to mean the expansion of those that are now part of the underclass. Now, the, 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 that, so that's one thing. Intelligence predict, it is intelligence is negatively associated with breeding. 
What is positively associated with breeding, interestingly, is K strategy. So because if you, you if you if you want to use, if you don't want to have children, if you want to invest all your energy in sex, you don't want to invest it in uh, pro, in uh, nurture, and therefore you can avoid having to have children and look after them by successfully using contraception, and so you do. And so it's been found that the country is becoming more K strategy, more slow life history strategy. Things are slowing down, and this is evidence in the fact that religiousness, which is associated with this kind of K strategy investment and love and strong bonding and this kind of thing, and agreeableness and conscientiousness, um, religiousness, religiousness predicts fertility. So those are the two directions that we're moving in. Lower intelligence people are having children and more religious people are having, are having uh, children. So there should be changes in, in that regard. Uh, but th th there will still be socioeconomic class differences. There always are. They are perhaps bigger if the country has a larger gene pool. So I, I would say that they're, they're more subtle, the they're, 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 they're finer differences than you get in Finland. For example, uh, but I've done studies on social class in Finland, and it's a, a very real thing as well there. Although it's more difficult to divide the social classes up. But the key point is that no matter what uh, leftist uh, middle class academics may tell you, social class in England is a real thing, and uh, it, it allows correct predictions to be made. So yeah. So um, I hope this has been of interest, and if it has, then feel free to subscribe to me on on. Uh, 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 Twitter, no PayPal and uh, uh, Patreon, that's it, uh, and uh, subscribe star uh, and, and and to yes, and do hit that like button and 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 uh, uh, whatever it is, subscribe to the channel. Uh, and and um, uh, if you have any other ideas, then please do get in touch with me, and I will see you soon. And um, tally ho.